invite you to open with me to the book of Matthew as we're continuing through our study of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. And as you do, uh, just to share with you, two of my favorite things are the outdoors, to be out in nature, but also I do thoroughly enjoy fire. I don't know many men who also don't enjoy fire. I saw a few thumbs up even in the back. That's fantastic. Um, but whenever you put those two things together, it's, it's just a wonderful combination of just joy in my life. I remember it was the fall of 1997. I was a junior in high school, and for some reason, my parents allowed me to go camping in northwest Arkansas, and I, I believe there's a few that are watching online that I tend to pick on Arkansas, and they're not here with us today, and they always get upset that I pick on Arkansas. Arkansas, northwest Arkansas, beautiful. Uh, there's the Buffalo River Trail, and uh, my friends, they had been camping many different times on their own even as teenagers, and, and they invited me to come along. My parents allowed me to do so, and we did the whole thing. We did what I considered real camping. Uh, I know some of you are glampers, and some of you may even do the, the RV thing. No shade, you know, do you, do what you want to do, but it was fun for me to truly get the backpack, get the gear, get the sleeping bag, hike a few miles into the middle of nowhere, and be able to set up your own camp, do your own thing. And I, I didn't know what I was doing. I was literally along for the ride. And they said, hey, man, we're going to teach you how to rappel. We're going to teach you how to rock climb, how to tie up the rope, put on the harness, all this different stuff. But to begin with, uh, it's freezing because it was November and it was about 30 degrees. And they said, we need fire. And I was like, I can, I can, I can do that. So they, they gave me this piece of metal and they're like, here, take, use this, go get, cut some wood. And I was like, it's just a thin piece of metal. They're like, come on, man, you, you, you rearrange it and it turns into a saw, saw some stuff down, get it going, get some kindling, get this fire going because it's cold. And so I finally got uh, enough wood kind of brought about and then we got the kindling and we got the firewood and we placed it there within the pit and we, it, it was just this wonderful moment. There's nothing like waking up when it's just freezing cold on a camping trip and just having a warm cup of coffee. I didn't drink coffee then. Warm cup of hot chocolate and then um, just, just some warm, warm oatmeal because it was just so, so soothing. But to sit around that campfire, whether in the morning or even at evening with my buddies, just to be able to talk and just to be able to hang out, it provided light, it provided warmth, it provided community, uh, it cooked our food. It did so much for us. And so as beautiful those two things are, outdoor natures and fire, uh, there were reports, or not reports, but it was reported uh, just even a few years later that different parts of the Buffalo River Trail in Arkansas had uh, accidentally caught fire. And it was as the case that we saw even, you know, some of you remember the fires in Gatlinburg back in 2016. Some of you can just basically turn on the news anytime and see in California there seems to be a fire. And fire is wonderful, but fire can be incredibly devastating if it's not contained within the, the proper place and proper confinement. What we're about to launch into this morning is, is a topic and an issue that sometimes is ignored within the life of the church. And I definitely don't want us to be that kind of people. I want us to be able to address anything and everything. Next week is going to probably even be maybe a little bit more uncomfortable because it's definitely a topic that we don't look at. But as I was praying throughout my time this week, what I wanted today to be more than, yes, we are going to focus on this issue. Um, but I want us to champion, first and foremost, what, what is beautiful and what is good. And, and what is right of what God has designed, of what God has established, and what he has gifted us with. And so with, with that in mind, my hope is that here at the beginning, we, we focus on the beautiful, but then we're aware and we're educated, regardless of what stage, season of life that you are in, it might be, it might be a moment where you go, I'm no longer married, so I'll check out. I'm not married, so I'll check out. This is something that all of us, because one, Jesus is speaking to it, that we need to submit our hearts, submit our minds, hear what he has to say, because even if it's something that particularly this, you don't struggle with, there perhaps are people in your life that you may not even be aware that this is a real wrestling match for them. And so I want us to look at it humbly, humbly tactfully, but also boldly because we're not ashamed and afraid to look at the truth of God's Word. So, Matthew 5, beginning in verse 27. Jesus continues from where he picked up off last week. He says, "'You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart.'" 
If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from your body, for it is better for you to lose one of your parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off, throw it from you, for it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Pray with me. Father, as we come to your word today, I do pray that we would have a heart and a mind that would submit to your truth and that we would have just a clarity, just an understanding that you are God, you are creator, and you are the designer of, of, of marriage, of sex. And so, Father, I pray that we would not take our cues from anyone else or any culture or any system other than what your word has to say. And so if you would, where you're praying, would you just ask the Lord to give you the focus and attention on this passage that he would still teach you, educate you, protect you? Would you pray for me? I'll teach this with boldness, with kindness, but with truth. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sex is a gift from the Lord. It is. Sometimes we hear that, and even sometimes we lower our eyes in a setting like this. Can we talk about it? Can we discuss it? Tactfully, yes. Biblically, absolutely and we must. But if you have a pen and a paper, I don't think I have it on the screen because I've been working on this passage for a long time. Uh, consider yourself blessed because I was going to do 31 and 32. They ain't no way I was going to get through all that in one sermon. But if you would write this down in the margin of your Bible or on a piece of paper, but one is, is this idea that sex is a gift from God, but it's given it's given to be enjoyed within the parameters of marriage, which is between one man and one woman for life. Sex is a gift given by us from God to be enjoyed within the parameters of marriage, which is between one man and one woman for life. And so Jesus says here, essentially, in a nutshell, it's not about adultery, though that's at the base level, like we looked at last week with murder and anger. It's really about lust. It's really about the heart of the matter. He's going to do exactly what we saw last week when he brought up uh, the issue of, of, of murder. And, and some of you may even recognize that when he quoted from last week in chapter 5, verse 21, and when he quotes here in chapter 5, verse 27, and when he says, you've heard it said that you shall not commit adultery, you might recognize those two from the Big Ten, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, you have commandment number six, thou shalt not commit murder. Commandment seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. So you have the two of, two of the Big Ten that are being brought by Jesus to these on the mountainside in the Sermon on the Mount. And they would all go, yeah, I know that one. And, and I obey that one. A lot of them would probably say, I got that covered, Jesus. But as I've mentioned to you, what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount is that the, the end of his introduction of this sermon, what he is desiring to do is say, I've not come to abolish or do away with the Old Testament, the law, and the prophets. I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets. In fact, what had happened over the centuries was uh, the religious leaders had taken the standard of God, the, if you think of it as like a bar, and they, they kept running into the bar, knocking the bar down, and they said, that standard is just too high and too lofty, so we're going to make the, the bar here. That's where we're going to set up the bar. And now we can clear it. Now it's okay. And Jesus is coming onto the scene and saying, you're missing the heart of the law. You've lowered the standard of the law. I'm putting it back in place. And we're drilling down into the heart's intention of God's good and perfect law. And so if last week was about, you've heard it said that you will not commit, a, commit murder. And he drills down into the issue of anger. If you would, maybe in just two words, what I would say last week could kind of be summarized as is Jesus is talking about the sanctity of life. Because remember last week I shared with you that we're all created in the image of God. You may not feel this way, but every single one of you is valuable and valued in the sight of God because he created you. You're a valuable person. And what we do is we 
Sometimes don't value ourselves, and sometimes we don't value others whom God has created in His image. And so we lash out, them, out at them with anger or with insults, as we saw last week. And sometimes it can carry over into wanting to cancel someone, dismiss someone, want them gone from my life. We may not technically pull the trigger, but we don't want them around. And he's getting to the heart of that. He's talking about the sanctity of life. Here he's talking about the sanctity of relationships. And he goes back to the first relationship that was ever established in the book of Genesis when he brought Adam and Eve together in Genesis chapter 2 and that first kind of wedding ceremony. And you, and you see that what God has designed and what God has created, he doesn't want anybody to, to separate. He doesn't want anything to come in and, 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 and get a wedge in between that husband and that wife, that man and that woman in this relationship that he has established and that he has ordained because it's good. God, God has created it. But, and, and within that, we have the gift of being able to consummate that, that love and that relationship with the gift of sex. It's the most intimate means by which we can be drawn and connected to one another. But we have an enemy, Satan, who wants to take a gift and anything good that God designs and creates, and he wants to twist it, and he wants to manipulate it, and he wants to pervert it, and he wants to counterfeit it. He wants to get into the culture and into the stream of the culture of well, this is okay because we've advanced in our understanding and knowledge in certain areas, or you, you need to experiment with this or that. And, and he's continuing to put that tease out there. But if we're not careful, the good gift, when it becomes counterfeited or twisted, it can become quite destructive. Again, to the illustration of fire, if, if you came over to my house, as some of you did last week, and you came into my living room, and what if you showed up, as you did last week, some of you, as we had Bible study for our small group, Doug's, Doug and Janice's small group. If I came in and I had just some, some, a pile of wood in my arms, and then, and then I, I, I came in the living room, and I just dumped that there, and, and, uh, and then I come back and I have a little bit of maybe some pine straw or some needle, and I put that down there, and then I come in with a lighter, and you're like, what? what's the madman doing? No, it's cool. I like fire. It's cold in here. We want to get, we want to, we want to be warm. You one would go, I'm never coming back to this Bible study. And then, and then two, you, you say, Some, something's off about this. Especially for those of you who, who have been in my home, you would notice that last week, there's no appropriate place to light a fire. We don't have a fireplace. It's just a living room. But if I went over to your place, and I don't know who of you has a fireplace, but if I went over to your place and, I, and you showed up and you had a bundle of wood in your arms and you brought it into your living room, and then you place it there in that fireplace, and you have it there where it's designed to be, what once was a dangerous, <laughs> and the consequences of lighting a fire in the middle of my living room floor, it might just destroy the living room floor because we get, we get a hold of it quick enough. But it might spread, and then it costs me, maybe my life. Maybe I get burned. Maybe it burns my wife as a consequence of lighting that fire. Maybe it burns some people who I invited into my life and into my home because they're there thinking things are fine, but there's a consequence. And it could possibly even go so wild that it begins to catch fire and it takes out my neighbor's house and it takes out my other neighbor. And, and you just see it begin to spread and grow. Whereas you can take that same amount of combustion with that wood and with that fire, place it there within the confines of where it's designed to be, a fireplace or a fire pit, and what it provides is just what it did on that camping trip. Warmth, community, light. It's a beautiful thing. But if we don't have it within the parameters for which it's designed, it can get out of control and it can devastate. And so, as we would say, within the life and with the gift of sex is that within the confines or the parameters that God has established, some people might say, well, I feel like it's being restrictive. I'm not being able to express myself. And what God is wanting to do is say, no, 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 this is a good thing. I've designed and created it. If you'll do it my way, you will flourish. You will enjoy. The, the, the statistics even show that those who are within a, a, a healthy, loving marriage relationships are the most sexually satisfied. But we think it's going to be something outside some of you, uh, I've mentioned before, we've had the opportunity, Tiffany and I, to be able to go through uh, premarital counseling with a sweet young couple that 
I'm getting to, to perform the ceremony this Friday and super excited about it. And as we've gone through that, we've, we've dealt on a lot of those issues of communication and expectation and finances and how to, how to fight fair and all those fun things that you have with, with marriage counseling. And, and we did. We, we, we discussed intimacy and we, we discussed sex. And uh, I shared with them something that my parents' pastor has mentioned often that has resonated and stuck with me is that what Satan wants to do with your sex life is he wants you to have sex way before you're married. And then once you're married, he never wants you to have it again. Because he knows how powerful it is and how connective it is. But he wants you to have that before him because he's counterfeit. He's destructive. He does not care for you. The world does not care for you. God does. He said, here's a good gift. Go about it my way. And so, uh, some of times we, we might think, well, is God really for this? Is this a gift? I want to take you to a passage of Scripture from the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon chapter 4. I want you to follow along with me. It'll be on the screen, but some of you maybe have never read the Song of Solomon because it's poetry. And it's not just poetry. It's ancient Near Eastern poetry. So it's old poetry from a culture I don't even understand. It just doesn't make sense. It's like reading Shakespeare, but just a lot worse. I mean, it's hard to get and to grasp. So let me give you the Cliff Notes version. In chapters one through three, you get to see this beautiful picture of Solomon and the Shulamite woman and their attraction and their courtship with one another. Solomon's pursuing her. And then we, we find as they finally, they, that they get married and they, they, they wait to consummate their relationship. And in chapter four, you get to go into the bedroom chamber and you get to see this incredible display of Again, God's gift that he's given us between a man and a woman for life and marriage. And if you read through verses 1 through 8 of Solomon chapter 4, he basically just takes a look at his bride on his wedding night, and from head downward, he compliments her as she stands there before him as his bride. And then you get into verse 9, and listen to what he says. He says, For you have made my heart beat faster, my sister, my bride. Yeah. That's the truth. Now, when you say, why does he say my sister? It's not a sister, first of all. And second of all, it's because it's such a deep familial love. He says, you have made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes, with a single strand of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils that all kinds of, than all kinds of spices. Your lips, my bride, drip honey. Honey and milk are under your tongue, and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. Notice how many times he refers to garden. A garden locked is my sister, my bride. A rock garden locked. A spring sealed up where your shoots, referring to many believe her legs, your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits, henna and nard plants, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, along with the finest spices. You or a garden spring, a well of fresh water and streams flowing from Lebanon. That's Solomon talking to his bride on his wedding night. And the bride responds, Awake, O north wind, and come, wind of the south. Make my garden breathe out fragrance. Let its spices be wafted abroad. May my beloved come into his garden and eat its choice fruits. Solomon responds, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh along with my balsam, and I have eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. We don't have time to go into it, but that's super hot. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like, whew. It's, it's passionate. It's intimate. And it's one of those things that we go, that's in Scripture? Yeah, it is. God's not shy about sex within marriage, within the confines and the parameters that he set up because it's good. It's a gift. If you think it's not, right after this in verse 5, 1c, <laughs> now there's this chorus that speaks who's celebrating and is cheerleading this relationship. And they say, eat, friends, Drink and imbibe deeply, O oh lovers. What this group of people are saying is what you have done and experienced is good. In fact, when it says drink and imbibe deeply, literally it's drink and be drunk, intoxicated with your love. 
and with your intimacy because it's good. God approves this within the confines of marriage between one man, one woman for life. And so I wanted to highlight and champion the good, the positive, the design, because it could be easy for us to to go into and look at this passage from Matthew and go, well, now we're talking about adultery, and now we're talking about lust, but we have to because there are enemies, as Solomon would say, there are little foxes, if we're not careful, that can disrupt the wedding uh, relation or the marriage relationship and the intimacy that should be there. And Jesus, because he champions this, because he is God in the flesh, he, he's wanting to be protective and preventive of us so that our marriage relationship, your future marriage relationship, will, will thrive. And I would say that most of us agree that boundaries are good. Most of us would probably agree within this room that, that the boundaries of, 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 of sex when it comes to age and consent, we would say, yeah, there should be some boundaries there. And interestingly enough, one study that I found is that specifically the boundary of between a man and a woman being married, a study in America was done that 90% of men, when the question was asked, is there ever a reason to ever be allowed to have sex outside of marriage? 90% of men said no. That means 10% of men said, yeah, there can be a reason why. 95% of women said no. That means there were 5% of women who said, yeah, there could be a reason or excuse to go outside the marriage bed. So even as a whole, the majority of even our culture, who is nominal Christian at best, Christian just maybe by name, but not by practice and deed and devotion, would say, yeah, there, there should be a commitment between a man and between his wife. But yet in some areas of, of, of when it comes to marriage and, and, and sex and, and relationships, that as a culture, but also that has crept within the life of the church, is this idea that if I really want to know this person, and I've heard it often, it's been mentioned to me often in in counseling sessions, is this idea that I want to know if we're going to be compatible sexually before we get married, so we need to be able to know if if we're, we're going to be able to work. And my response to that is, he made you a man, he made you a woman, you're going to be compatible. That's how he's designed it. And the joy of the process is figuring out one another. But beyond that, we go into, well, it makes sense to me, pastor, that what if, what if we take the time to, to not only know if we're compatible physically together, but, but also to make sure that we're, our marriage is going to work. And, and I understand to a degree where some of the mindset goes of, well, what if we practice this thing called marriage? Well, what if we practice this thing and we do take the opportunity to, to live together before we get married to see if this is going to work, to cohabitate? Well, one, the study and the statistics show that cohabitation is not helpful at all in your marriage relationship. But, 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 but two, it's this idea that it's the wisdom of man of this makes sense to me. And I get where a lot of it stems from, from my generation and younger, because divorce has been rampant. And I believe that most young people, they, I mean, does anybody go into a marriage and go, I hope this fails? No. And so to be in their mind's eye and their wisdom, as best as they know how, they're like, what if we do practice this? Maybe, it, maybe we'll know if, if, if this is going to work because I don't want to go through what my parents went through or what my aunt and uncle went through, what my grandparents went through because it's devastating. I, was the, I experienced the effect of that divorce as a child and I don't want to have that, so let's, let's practice this thing. And so by man's wisdom, it seems to maybe there's, maybe there's some sense to it, but, but God has designed it in such a way that that that's something that, that we don't enter into, that God would say, no, 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 I've designed it to where that when it's time for you to come together, you will leave your father and mother and you will cleave to your wife. And then you habitate. And then there's the intimacy. And then you begin to grow together. We don't play house until we are actually married and together in that house together. But it has, that, that, that mindset and philosophy has crept in from the culture into the church. I would just say, just, as last week, beware. Beware. And again, some of you might say, I'm married. I, 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 I don't plan to ever get married again, or I'm not married right now. Every single one of you, one, some of you, you long to get married. You need to listen to this. Some of you are married right now, and you're like, well, you know, we, we did cohabitate. Are we, are, are we evil people? God is good all the time. 
Anytime we do something that's outside of the bounds of Scripture, I'm sure I did some stuff yesterday I didn't even know about, but I've had in my head some thoughts and words that I said that was probably outside the bounds of Scripture. But God is good to bear with me and to love me, forgive me. But it doesn't mean that we sweep things under the rug. It means we deal with it, we confess it, and we say, God, forgive me, and I'm moving forward in your grace and in your love. Because what we're about to enter into is Jesus isn't just going to be talking about adultery and staying faithful to one another as a husband and as a wife. But he, he wants to drill and go to the heart of the matter. As I mentioned last week, the stream illustration, the, the, the idea of like if you're seeing a stream floating from this side to that side, good luck, Chris, again with that, um, floating from this side to that side, is you have this pool that eventually the stream reaches to, which is murder or adultery, as he mentioned last week with murder. But what, what, was to the, what got to the point of where all of a sudden I killed a guy? Or what got to the point of I cheated on my spouse? It wasn't you woke up one day and said, I will cheat on my spouse. Again, I don't think anyone wants to ruin their marriage or their relationship. There were things upstream that were polluting to the point to where you got to that moment. And so as we go upstream, that's what Jesus is doing, saying at the root of it all is we need to get to the heart, and we're dealing with the issue of of lust. So look at what he says. He says, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, lust is often generated, um, permeated visually. It's by what we see. Specifically, I'm not a woman. I'm a man. And I just know as a guy, that's a big thing for us. We are visual beings. Uh, Studies have shown it. Sociologists have studied this. Psychologists have looked at this. It's just a thing that as guys, I'm not saying that women aren't visual creatures, but guys are very much visual creatures. Like, like that's something that, 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 again, when you read that story uh, of the Solomon and the Shulamite woman, or his bride on the night of their wedding, is he's just admiring her with his eyes as he looks from her from head to toe. And so as a result, what we have to be careful with is is what does it mean when it says someone who looks at a woman? Because sometimes we read this and we go, here's Jesus again just going extreme. I can't even look at a lady now. Is that what you're telling me? Well, hang on. You remember David in the Old Testament, King David killed Goliath? One of the saddest stories comes out of in David's life is there was one night or there was this time where he was supposed to be going to war with his armies. He decided to stay home. He wasn't doing his job. And he goes out onto his balcony and in Jerusalem, where he was at the capital, the palace, he's able to kind of be up a little bit higher. Jerusalem is a little bit hilly and he can look down and see all of the houses that are there below him. And a lot of people in that day and time, because it hot. They're going to do a lot of their stuff outside on their rooftops because it's just it's too warm to be inside. And it says that he went out onto his rooftop and there he saw or he looked and he saw Bathsheba, the beautiful Bathsheba. And what he did, it wasn't one of these of like, oh, there's Bathsheba. I need to look away. That's, that's not appropriate. It's he looked and what turned from a gaze turned into a uh, or excuse me, what turned from a glance turned into a gaze. He just began to just focus in on her. And the lust that was already there within his heart because he was distant from God and the things that God would want him to do as king of Israel, he sees her. He doesn't just glance. He begins to gaze. He begins to long. And he says, men, go get her. Many believe, many commentators believe that she was forcibly taken to David. So she's taken She gets pregnant. He commits adultery. Because it wasn't just simply a glance. Some some of you specifically, as as guys, you're like, so can I just, can I look at someone, admire, like, hey, you're pretty. Sure. It's the gaze. It's the longing. It's the looking. It's the staring. It's the oogling. It's going beyond just simply, especially if we see something that is, as we would all define, I think we can have a good definition of what's inappropriate. If we see something inappropriate, it's not like, it's no. When I was in Russia on a mission trip, uh, young guy, people in Russia, magazine stands in Russia, different from the United States. And I can remember my discipler who was leading that trip. He said, guys, or there were uh, uh, one, four of us. He said, when we're walking down the street, 
because we want to hold each other accountable and we don't want the devil to get a snare into the work that we're doing here. And he can very easily, because we are visual guys, that we're going we're gonna to help each other out and we're going to call out things. But we don't want to make it a big deal. We don't want it to be something where the girls on our trip are like, what are you guys doing? What are you talking about? So we would just simply go, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock. So if we were walking down the street and we saw that there was a magazine stand coming up at 3 o'clock, it was like 3 o'clock, and we all know, avert your gaze, because we don't want that glance to turn into a gaze, because we don't want our hearts to be disrupted, because we were there on mission to reach people for Christ. And there's nothing more that Satan would want to do within the life of a mission trip or in the life of a church or in the life of your family than to disrupt it with the bomb of sexual immorality. The girls, though, they were like, why do you guys keep calling out random times? It's like two in the afternoon, and you said 12 o'clock again. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You just keep walking. We're, we're fine. But there might be things that you need to do, some preventative measures in your life, and not fall into the consequences of David. Because when he committed that adultery with Bathsheba, when that glance turned into a gaze and more, up until that point, his life, his ministry, his leadership was impeccable. From that moment on, the consequences never stopped loss of a child, rebellious children, loss of a kingdom for a time. Like it, 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 was, it was awful for him. He was forgiven. God forgave him. But he still had to experience some of the consequences because, if you will, that, that fire got out of control. It didn't stay within the parameters of where it was supposed to be. I don't really want to go too deep into stats because I think a lot of people do that to sensationalize this issue. But I think we can all agree that the rise of just explicit, illicit images is, since the invention of the internet, it's remarkable. Uh, there was one study that I found that today uh, a young man can see more images, uh, inappropriate images, in uh, five minutes than his great-grandfather could in his entire lifetime. I mean, it's just a remarkable increase. We, we know this. We're all aware of this. And the point of this isn't to, to, to sensationalize anything. The point of this is to hopefully educate and to bring awareness to, to the reality and not stick our head in the sand and go, I know it's out there, but I want to ignore it. Because some of you are parents and grandparents, and you can't ignore it. For yourselves as individuals, because you may have your own struggles, but for your children and your grandchildren, so that you're properly just educated so that you can say, no, 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 this is something that we don't want to, we don't want to stray and, and, and go away from. We want to, we want to deal with it appropriately and, and biblically. The, the rise of these images we, we found today that if you're a 14 to 18 year old male, 84% of 14 to 18 year old men or boys have seen pornographic material. 57% of 14 to 18 year old females have viewed pornography. It's a very common thing for minors to be able to have that ability and that access. And sometimes what we might say is like, oh, my phone's over there. All oh, these phones, they're horrible. That's a tool. Any tool can be used inappropriately. It's what we do with it, how we train it. Again, my dad, growing up, I learned my love of fire from him. <laughs> He's like, let's light a fire, boys. Let's, let's have some fun. But he showed us how to appropriately handle fire so that it, we weren't burned, so it didn't get out of control. And that's a responsibility I think we have as a church. I think it's a responsibility that we have as, as parents, grandparents, and just friends with one another to hold each other accountable because we know this is a good thing and we don't want to let Satan be able to take it and mar it. It's not right. The other thing that will happen with this, and some of you know this and realize this, but I want you to hear that it affects your relationships, this issue of lust. It affects your relationships. And again, this is for all of you, regardless of what stage you're in. But I, but I do want to mention whether it affects your relationships now or maybe even your future relationships. You're like, I'm not even married. It will affect going into that marriage. It's something that we get a hold of. But I do intentionally want to speak to our men, our young men, our married men, our fathers, our grandfathers, that if, if you are struggling with the issue of lust and pornography, though you have done a good job of hiding it, the consequences and the effects of it don't stay hidden. It, it, it permeates out. The relationship with your wife is affected because of this. It, it, it's just too often studies have shown you're, you're viewing images that are counterfeit images of, of images and expectations and ideas that are just not right, and it lowers your libido. 
But one, one study that I found years ago that has resonated with me ever since, and you all know my longing to have, to have children, and it really impacted me. The pastor in Arizona was talking about how the study has shown that if our fathers specifically, so listen to me, dads and granddads, our fathers specifically, who hopefully set the tone and lead the home spiritually, that if this is a, a struggle or a wrestling match that you have, and you are keeping it hidden so you think it's not really affecting others, Studies have shown that for dads who, who wrestle with pornography, it affects their relationship with their children, specifically, specifically their daughters. Because think about, think about a dad just playing with his daughter growing up, throwing her in the air, wrestling with her, and then she turns from a little baby girl, sweet little thing, to becoming a woman. And yeah, the relationship does change a little bit. but where she should be experiencing and receiving appropriate affection. She's not. So she begins to look for it elsewhere. But because that father doesn't want to be perceived as that guy, which is a good thing, who's creepy and inappropriate, is because he's seen images of young women that aren't far off from the age of his little baby girl. And he wants to stay at arm's length because I don't want to be that guy. Again, th th this is so much more than just your marriage. And this is even so much more than just your relationship with your kids. When, when we go down and we get ensnared with this, and the sad thing is that uh, I've mentioned men, but the rise of this struggle for women is, is on the rise. Is that we would come back and we would say, no, 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 what has God created that is good and how do we get back to that? As I mentioned to you last week, sometimes what we do is we, we hear the mantra of the world, follow your heart, do what you want to do, you be you. We, we mentioned last week, following your heart is not healthy. Others will say, well, lead your heart. That's okay, but left to my own devices, my own desires, if I lead my heart, I'm going to lead myself into some dangerous spots. We've got to submit our heart. I mentioned to you last week that we would, that we would submit our heart to the Lord. But I'm asking that we would every day submit our heart to the Lord on a daily basis, on a daily basis. And so when Jesus gets into this, he, he, he begins to give these practical examples of, of how we would respond and react to this. And, and he shares basically, if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out. If your right arm makes you stumble or, 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 or struggle, cut it off. And some people read this and go, that's really extreme and kind of gross. And that's the point. <laughs> It's, it's intended to be shocking. It's intended to get, get your attention because we should have that same kind of shock when we sin against God. It should be shocking to us. And yeah, it, this does seem extreme, but I'll tell you, man, when you become desperate enough in any area of life, you're willing to do some pretty remarkable and ridiculous things. I mean, not, not even on this issue, but you should have seen some of the stuff I, I tried to do because I was desperate for a girl. <laughs> some of the, just the ridiculous, embarrassing things that I would do. When you're desperate, you will do some ridiculous stuff. And this, Jesus is saying, man, if you're desperate, man, do what must be done. Now, we got to be careful because if, <laughs> this is figurative language. Now, there were some in the early church, one of our early church fathers, Origen, a long time ago, he took that passage, he struggled with lust, and he had himself castrated. And if we take this literally, then in the years to come, there might be some people without eyeballs and hands in this room, because this is a real issue of lust. But we do, we take it figuratively, but we, we, we take the, the heart of it, the principle of it, that we are extreme with this. And some might say, well, why does he use the, the, the imagery of the right hand or the right eye? Well, in that culture, the right was dominant, the right was best. Think about how Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. It's a place of priority, it's a place of, of dominance, that kind of thing. Same thing here, the right arm's your strong arm, your strong hand, that kind of thing. And Jesus is saying, that would be your most precious hand. This is your most precious eye. Even what's precious with you, deal with it. Because there is nothing too precious to eliminate from your life if it's going to cause your heart to stumble. Nothing. What you watch. Do you need to get rid of some things? Places you go that you know is like a trigger for you. If, if I go to that place, if I go with that group of people, it's going to trigger something in me. 
where, where you walk in a store, relationships that you have that might need to be cut off in order to, 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 to be protective. Some of you, your, your phone, incredible tool, dangerous access if you're not careful with the issue of lust. And you're like, I've talked to young guys and they're like, I struggle with lust, pastor. What should I do? I was like, well, what do you have set up on your phone? I don't have anything set up on my phone to be able to be protective. All right. Uh, Where do you have your phone at nighttime? Right by my head on my bed stand. So that way I can use my alarm clock. I'm like, so you're telling me that you're putting a device that can give you any kind of image that you want right next to your bed. And you said that often the most difficult times that you struggle with the area of lust is at night by yourself. And you have access to all that. That'd be like taking a glass of whiskey, putting it on the bedstand next to an alcoholic and saying, good luck. Let's see if you touch it or not. And the response that I will get is, well, that's my alarm clock. I got a, I got, my phone is my alarm clock. Two responses. Get an alarm clock or set your phone up on the other side of the room Connect it to the charger, turn up that alarm super loud, you'll wake up and you'll probably get up better because you had to physically get up and you can get your day going and it's going to be awesome and you didn't have any struggle the night before. So put those measures in place. Some of you remember the story of Joseph back in the book of Genesis, how he was sold into slavery by his brothers, real classy, Um, and then... And then he gets sold, and finally he gets to Potiphar's house, and he's helping Potiphar just make bank. He's making him all kinds of money. And Joseph is young, he's smart, he's intelligent, he's handsome. And Potiphar's wife goes, I'm interested in you. She's flirting with him, probably inappropriate with him, nothing too extreme. Finally, it comes to the point where she's so brash and so bold, she says, let's go to bed. Sometimes what we do when it comes to the issue of lust is we go, I don't want to crush it. I need to figure out how to, how to, how to navigate this. Because what, what Joseph didn't do in that moment, he's like, well, you know what? You really need to hear what the Lord has to say about this issue of adultery. You really need to hear what the Lord has to say. I, I have to keep my witness with you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to step back, but I can't be rude to you because that might mess up our relationship. And then who's going to tell you about God? All kinds of reasons of why we can justify to not leave the situation. But instead, what Joseph does, he just bolts out of there. Some believe in his underwear or just naked. Because she grabbed his robe and held on tight. And he's like, I don't care. I'm gone. You can have my robe. You will not have my character. I'm gone. I'm desperate to eliminate what might cause my heart to stumble. Some of you recall... Uh, or as, as Jesus is saying, <laughs> you, you would want to give up that which is most precious to you, even physically, rather than your whole body be cast into hell or for you to die. You want to preserve yourself because you want to be free. Some of you may remember that years ago, there was a guy by the name of Aaron Ralston. He was a, a hiker. He liked to go into the canyons and hike, and well, kind of like I like to do. He was by himself. He went way out there in the middle of nowhere, And as he was hiking through one of these canyons, uh, he had an accident in which he fell and this large boulder, it came down and it it trapped his arm. And he was stuck there for 127 hours. I don't want to do the math. That's a long time. I don't know how many days that is. But he's stuck there. All he had was one of those Nalgene bottles with some water in it, not even a full bottle. And he's sitting there and it he's doing everything he can. He's taking his, his Leatherman knife with the pliers and, you know, that little fun little Swiss army kind of looking thing. And he's just jabbing at this, this rock to try to get out. And he's just dulling that knife and nothing's happened. Nothing's happening. And finally he gets to a point of desperation because when you're desperate enough, you'll eliminate some pretty precious things to you. And what he found was this. My arm is starting to decompose. If I don't deal with this, I die. Do I want to die or just want to have my arm die? Apparently, if you're a doctor or nurse in here, I apologize. I'm horrible with the human body and medicine. I think there's two bones in here somewhere. Hey, excellent. (laughs) And so he's wedged with this boulder and this canyon wall. And he just goes, breaks both of the bones. Frankly, that was the easy part. 
then he begins to recognize that what I need to do is I need to begin to try to cut my arm off. Now, if you're squeamish, I'm going to show you something. But all it is, one of our ladies had to leave. I sent Laura in this video. I was like, hey, can you show this on Sunday and see if Chris can get it edited? And she, was, she didn't know what it was, and she put a puke face on the text back. She's like, that's disgusting. <laughs> this, so if you are squeamish, you, you, you may not want to listen. But Aaron Ralston went back with Tom Brokaw to this canyon and kind of gave his, you know, what happened. He, he was sharing his story. And obviously, I'm not going to show you the whole thing because it's too, too long, but I'm showing you about a minute and a half as he's sharing this story of what he had to do here at the end, because it wasn't just enough to break the arm. He, he had to do more than that. And he experienced, it was hard. Can I tell you, dealing with something you struggle with is hard. Some of you in this room are like, I don't struggle with lust. I don't, I don't get how people struggle with that. Good for you. Lots of people do. And it's hard to wrestle with what you struggle with and overcome. So, would you guys play that? I just dove into this exercise, this, this surgery, surgical procedure. I put the tourniquet on, and I was bleeding down the wall, and I severed the artery. And I he cut through more muscle through the other and two more arteries, then tendon, the most difficult layer. His dull knife was unable to cut through. So I ended up taking the pliers side of the knife and using that to, to grab and twist and rip. Um, until the tendon gave way. And then I was looking at the, the nerve, this little strand of spaghetti <laughs> running, through, running through my arm. And I had to take the knife and pry it up. And even just when I touched it, it felt like the fire of sticking my arm into a, into a uh, just a pot of liquid metal. It, it, it burned all the way up up my arm, and, and I took it again and, and lifted it up. I knew that it was going to hurt, and I plucked it up and did it in a motion like that, and that, that fire sensation redoubled and went all the way up to my shoulder. But I knew that that was the hard part. And then, boom, and I wasn't even attached anymore, and I fell down like this, and I... I, I I was free. I was free. A lot of hardship. Loss. Something precious was eliminated. Your arm. But I was free. Again, the entire point of today in no way is to drive even deeper maybe a a stake into your life of shame or guilt. That is not what this is designed for today. Our design is at the beginning to prop up what is beautiful and champion it and be aware that an enemy is wanting to counterfeit it and distort it to destroy you and to destroy those around you. Because the consequences are devastating. So I ask you this question. In your life, do you understand what's at stake? Do you? And if you do, then you know it's worth eliminating. So what specifically needs to be eliminated if, in particular, this area is a struggle and a wrestling match for you? Because if you don't deal with it seriously, extremely, as Jesus is saying, you lose. You lose in your relationships. You lose in your future relationships. Your kids lose. The community loses. The church family loses. Your spouse loses. You lose. So submit your heart to the Lord on a daily basis. Champion for those of you who are married, champion the gift of marriage and the gift of sex. Let it be enjoyed within the parameters of a marriage between one man, one woman for life. But what I want to invite you to do this morning, we're, we're about to partake of the Lord's Supper. And I know today is a little, in some ways, heavy, but hopefully also 
we're fixing our gaze on what he has designed and go, that's what I'm going after. That's beautiful. I don't want to get distracted by this messy stuff that Satan's got his fingers on. And so in just a moment, we're going to sing. But as we would do any time before the Lord's Supper, you prepare your heart to take of the bread and the cup. You confess and you admit things in your life that may be separating you from him. And what I'm asking you to do this morning is, is two things, submit and separate, submit and separate. And literally by right next to the, the little cup and bread capsules and there's pieces of paper and there's pen. And for some of you, what, what I would encourage you to do is don't, don't partake of the Lord's Supper until you have written down what it is that you need to submit and again, some of you, the struggle for you is, is not in the area of, of, of lust. Maybe it was last week. Maybe it was anger. You're an angry little thing. Maybe that's what you need to submit before you take the Lord's Supper today. But all of us have areas in our life because none of us are perfect. And we all need forgiveness. And we all need grace. And we need people to bear with us and to walk with us and not go, ew. For some of you, what you need to submit is a judgmental, condescending attitude towards people who struggle <laughs> with lust and anger. That's, so, that's called self-righteousness. We don't want that in here either. And so when you write down what you submit, I submit my heart, I submit my marriage, I submit my eyes, I submit my kids, I submit my, the way I dress, what I allow on TV, I submit my phone, I submit my future spouse Whatever it is, I, there's a whole litany of things. I don't know what it is for you. Write down what you submit, and then if it's a struggle for you, write down how you can practically separate, eliminate that, to put precautions in. Maybe it's an accountability partner. 